So we have one more presentation uh, in the session, and it is Interference, Adapting Player Music Interaction in Games to a Live Performance Context. So let us welcome uh, Matthew Wang. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. Yeah, so today I'll be talking about something, a project I worked on as an undergraduate last year at Princeton. Um, as my senior thesis, it's a, essentially a web music game, multiplayer music game, uh, specifically designed for live performance um, and specifically for the Princeton Laptop Orchestra, although it's also sort of evolved into something as a web application that is accessible to anyone uh, just to sort of be played with for fun uh, and just for music making, for also music making for non-musicians to sort of thing. Um, yeah, and also just a bit about me. I'm, again, graduated last year from Princeton, and now I'm working uh, in the music department there as a computer music and electronic music researcher. So, yeah, I'll start just a bit talking about uh, game music concepts that are relevant to this project, um, moving on to then how I'm sort of adapting some of those to live performance, then the application of the web technologies that I'm using. And I'd like to demo um, the actual application, hopefully including some of you guys, and I'll just talk about a little bit of future ideas, um, probably not for the specific project, but with this general sort of structure and concept in mind. Okay, so game music, um, if you want to just think of a game very generally as player interaction with a set of rules or objectives, whatever those may be, doesn't necessarily have to be digital, although I'm sort of specifically thinking of video games in this context. Um, and then game music, therefore, is music which is generated or assembled according to the state of that game, the actions of its players, and so on. Um, this necessarily means that game music itself is dynamic and changeable, um, which I'm sure is a concept that sort of no one, no one everyone here is quite familiar with. Um, but then there's also the major consideration of like what is the uh, relationship between the player and the music? Sort of what role is the music performing? Is it sort of an emotional um, enhancement of whatever else is going on non-musical in this game? Um, how is the player meant to listen to the music? Are they actually sort of participating in creating it or are they just a passive listener and it's a sort of background thing? And also then who or what is perceived performer of the music. Is the player sort of meant to feel that they're actually performing the music, or is there something in the game? And those are all sorts of important things to consider, especially for this sort of live performance context. So um, the main sort of way of thinking about that last problem, which is at the core of this um, that I've been working with, is this idea of proactive and reactive sort of musical forces. And that comes from this article, um, Interactivity and Music in Computer Games. Right, so proactive music is the idea of music which um, influences player action in a game in a very direct way, it sort of demands a specific response from, a pl from players. Um, and it's largely independent of intentional player input. I um, have some images here of games you may or may not know. Sort of Guitar Hero is like the archetypical music rhythm game, um, and that's very much proactive music where there's a track playing, essentially regardless of what the player is doing outside of just some menu options way ahead of time, um, and you are meant to, as the player, respond rhythmically to it. Um, and then in sort of the non-music game world, there's um, things like combat music or in such as um, the Metal Gear Solid series, which is a stealth game. There's different audio and musical cues to suggest when you've been seen and then demand the sort of response of, you know, hide. Uh, and on the flip side of this, there's reactive music, which um, indirectly, because obviously sort of a player themselves can't directly create sound with a game system. Um, a player is interacting with a game system which then produces this music reactively to whatever the player input is. Um, 
So it's determined by the gameplay and dependent on player input. And those sorts of examples could be anything from something like um, in The Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time, literally playing an instrument in game. Um, or more typically is things like when you are changing an area in a game. So this is a screenshot from a, on the bottom here from a Pokemon game. And if you enter sort of a new area, then it just changes whatever musical track is going on. Yeah, just those are sort of the two here. You'll see with these diagrams, there's sort of the player and game, I think, are sort of a very fixed unit in the context of games where there's interaction, again, between a player and a set of rules and objectives. And then there's really the main difference between proactive and reactive is just how uh, the music actually relates to um, player action. So something that arises out of these two sorts of musics um, in games is a feedback loop between the player and the music. So when you combine proactive and reactive music, uh, you get this feedback loop uh, whereby, for example, if a player commits to some action that then results in a reactive music, for example, going into a new area in a game, and then this music, um, you know, it's like very scary or something that is in the form a uh, proactive music that then may demand some response from the player, such as leave this area that you just entered. Um, and if you have certain relationships, you can end up in a feedback loop whereby um, the response that uh, the game, the music demands from the player then causes further player action that causes more music, which demands further action from the player. So this is something that definitely exists in games, but it's oddly enough not really present in music games. Music games typically have feature mostly a one directional sort of thing. So again, thinking of Guitar Hero or other rhythm games, it's almost all proactive music. And then there's also some other music oriented games that, um, such as, I don't know if anyone's heard of like Electroplankton, that's sort of the popular one, where it's very much a music making game, um, but there's not so much music that you're necessarily responding to as a player. Um, so I'm sort of thinking, how can I design a music game, essentially, for performance that takes these both, creates a feedback loop, and uh, you know, uses that for the, to drive um, a musical piece and performance? Yeah. So thinking about adapting this to live performance, um, I essentially want to create a music-focused game which is a combination of proactive and reactive music to establish player music feedback. And of course, there's certainly problems involved with this. There is a reason that most music games have more of a one directional relationship between the player and the music. Um, first of all, just being maintaining that feedback can be difficult when the focus is on the music in the sense that um, a player is less inclined to feel they should respond to something if they feel like they're also the source of it, um, which you know, is just sort of an odd uh, thing there. So there's different ways to solve this problem. Um, for my specific case, um, I essentially decided to implement uh, my game as a multiplayer structure so that um, you know, a player is not responding to whatever music they've generated themselves, but they're responding to the music um, the whole sort of congregate music, right, um, of all of the players. And this also sort of fits in very well to my specific case of designing this for live performance by an ensemble. Um, and it's also sort of worth pointing out that this sort of multiplayer structure is in many ways similar to traditional, like, open, pro open improvisation structures where sort of people are, it's very much about listening just as much as playing. Um, of course, then there's this other problem in a game context as opposed to open improvisation uh, where there are non-musical objectives sort of driving things forward. Um, so there's an issue of balancing the roles of player of a game and performer. 
um, essentially not letting, trying to not let one role sort of take over where as a performer of music you are ignoring the objective of the game or as a, the player of, a, of the game you are ignoring the musical aspects and it sort of becomes uninteresting. Um, this is sort of the more difficult of these problems perhaps. Um, and very generally, the solution is just to, as tightly as possible, tie game objectives and elements to musical objectives and elements. <coughs> All right, so I'll talk a bit now just about my about actual web audio uh, and implementation. Uh, sort of, why did I decide to make this a web-based application? Uh, I originally didn't uh, necessarily plan on having it be web-based. I had, did not before this project have much experience with web audio or um, web technologies, but um, after becoming aware of some tools and, and such that were available, it, it made sense as an option. Um, so importantly, it's sort of web, it, it's very nice how accessible web things are, not just for live performance, but also to anybody. Um, it's very convenient that's centralized on a server. It's very easy to update as opposed to, say, a max patch. Um, I don't need to constantly resend out every time I want to update to everyone who's performing the piece. And then also, again, existing tools. Um, I'm using here a cloud hosting service, um, Heroku platform, Node.js for the overall framework, Socket.io connection, um, and then a game multiplayer game framework called Lance. Um, Tone.js for audio, and Sync, which is a um, node package from Soundworks, um, which was also presented in the Web Audio Conference in 2016 in Atlanta, and that's for sort of precise synchronization since I'm using sort of a sequencer model here. Just to go quickly sort of through the general structure of how these things are put together, there's essentially the server engine running uh, constantly. A client makes a request for a connection and a room name, the client um, basically consisting of a sync client, which is a sort of clock, and then the uh, Tone.js sound engine. So make a request for a room name, the server creates a room and a sync server um, for, so that the synchronization is strictly um, encapsulated to that room. The room sends back um, confirmation of that and necessary player and game info to that client. And then it's sort of resolved to the state where the client is constantly sending um, input and events to the server to be processed and the, pro the server is sending synchronized um, information about the game state and events and other players and everything. Uh, and if you have multiple rooms and players, you sort of end up with a structure that looks like this. Okay, so I'd like to quickly try to demo this with some of you guys. Um, it doesn't necessarily scale that well with like tons of people, so maybe if the first four or five rows or so, if there's anyone who would like to try it out, um, just go to this link here, preferably using Chrome. I think audio works in Firefox, but there's some graphical issues, um, so yeah. And I'll just wait a bit before leaving this slide. Uh, hopefully, okay, cool. Uh, that's a pretty good number of people. <laughs> so you should be able to see um, just very basic controls and what, how to actually sort of play the game on your screen. Um, yeah, and just... I'll start it, and well, people will not be able to join after I start it, just so you know, uh, and then we can kind of see how it goes. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, you'll want to hit V, probably, just so you can see what's going on. Um, oh, sorry. One sec. Hmm. Uh, wonder why I'm having issues starting it. Sorry, one moment. Can I start if I'm, okay. I wonder if there's too many people. <laughs> Again, it doesn't scale quite well. So I apologize, um, but maybe if a few people could sort of just 
disconnect <laughs> uh, until there's maybe, you know, around 10 here, then hopefully that'll work. Huh. It's odd that it works in another room, but not this one. All right. Uh, yeah, it seems for some reason I can't start this, although for some reason I can start it in another room. I'm not sure why that might be, but uh, that's okay. I have a video, sort of. Okay, yeah, no, that's fine. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> that's Jeff, he advised me on this project. He's very, very helpful. <laughs> yeah, so maybe if a, yeah, a few people, like two or three, could join um, WAC2, maybe. <laughs> Okay, and I'll just try from here. Okay, so if you turn up your uh, volume as well, it's sort of these, these balls that go around and they uh, produce drones and you can place notes in synchronized sequencers by pressing space when they're sort of in your view. And I can zoom in on my specific view here. Yep, sorry. Um, there's this sort of thing. And then there's this sort of movement thing. This is actually how you play the game. Um, you're meant to sort of paint over everyone else's space. Uh, there's sort of different harmonic uh, fields that are attached to each color and so on, and eventually the objective is to cover everyone's space with the same color, and that's sort of the whole progression of the game. All right. Um, I'll just quickly close... Just sort of talking about potential future work with this. That's interesting. Okay. Um, so definitely with my particular invitation, I think uh, there isn't that much of a connection between the player and performer roles. Um, it's definitely easy to get caught up as a player of the game and not so much concerned with the music. Uh, so it's definitely there's some thinking to do about really how to connect those better. I think there's also the possibility of doing a fully audio-based game without any sort of visuals. Um, there's definitely with audio worklets um, a lot of potential for really flexible dynamic synthesis uh, based on the game parameters. Um, and then I also like to sort of think about uh, how instead of applying these sort of game concepts to live performance, but how to apply sort of these live music performance concepts to sort of social gaming context and also sort of, which is also then sort of related to music jam sort of uh, contexts. Right, thanks so much. Any questions? Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Um, interesting work. And I... I just wanted to come back to the kind of binary that you were talking about between player and performer. Right. Um, and I guess I'm wondering whether it's even a necessary consideration. Um, I mean, we were just having some discussion at lunchtime about making interactive dance works and working in the studio with the dancers making the work so that in the end the things couldn't be separated, the music and the interaction and the choreography were essentially the same thing. And I'm wondering whether just changing the mindset on the design intention there changes the way that you think about the design of the interaction where those things are no longer separate. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. I'd certainly agree the ideal is in design is, certain, is for those roles to be the same, there, that there is no separation. Um, I think it can be sometimes difficult to think exactly of InDesign, a, a game and a music system that really mesh that well. Um, no, but that's a very good point and perhaps sort of starting at that point, thinking of those roles as a single thing is, a, is useful. All right. Uh, Let's go ahead and wrap up the session.